Hey there, Internet. I'm Michael, and this is Two Can Play That Game, bringing you our video on how to play Above and Below by Red Raven Games. So, let's start with what is Above and Below? Well, looking at the box here, it's um, about a village that's above an underground canyon place. Yeah, uh, that's kind of right, because the nature of this game is there's kind of two games going on at once. You have the above ground game where you're building up your village, but then also the below ground game where you're able to send your villagers down into the depths of the darkness to explore and find places underground for you to expand your village. Now, this adventuring involves kind of a pick your own adventure aspect, whereby you roll dice to determine whether or not you're going to be successful. But each time you'll read a bit of story text and then you get to choose, are you going to try and do option one or option two, or maybe there are more options. And you're told how difficult it is to succeed. And then you choose which one you're going to go for. And then you roll your dice to see if you achieve it. So if this isn't very clear, why don't we take it to the table and I can teach you how to play above and below. So the aim of the game is to have the best village because your village got destroyed and you all went off to found your own village. And where you went, there are these caves underneath. So as well as building up your village above ground, you're also going to be exploring below the surface to expand your village there. To set up the game, you'll want to give each player their player board and then also the cube that matches the colour of this little banner in the top left here. So for this player board, it will be this blue cube. Also give each player one of these starting buildings. So these have three beds on the front and you can distinguish them from other buildings because as well as having the building symbol on the back, it has these three beds. Next, each player is going to need a set of the three starting villagers. So there's one with a feather on, one with a hammer and one with just the two dice. And you can tell the starting villagers because they have a different back that depicts a building. You'll then place these in your grassy area here that doesn't have a symbol on. If it's a four player game, the villager with the hammer will instead go in your exhausted area, which is marked with the moon symbol. But we're setting up for a two player, so they all start there. Next, get all six of the buildings that have the star on the back, and they also have it on the front, and lay these out. Then Get all of your buildings that have the key symbol on the back and also on the front here underneath the cost. Shuffle these and deal out four. The rest of the buildings with the keys on the back can go back in the box. They're not needed. Then take your house cards that have no extra symbol on the back, shuffle them all up and deal out four, leaving the pile on the table to be a draw pile. Then take your outpost cards, which are underground buildings, shuffle those, and again, you're going to want four to be turned over to be available to buy. And the rest will sit there as a stack to draw from during the game. Then place your reputation track in the middle of the table where all players can reach it. Then shuffle up all your villagers with the plane back and deal one to each of the spaces on the reputation board. The rest you'll want as a draw pile near the board. You'll then want to put all of your tokens in the middle of the table within easy reach of all players. 
Also, you'll need your dice and you'll need to shuffle your cave cards and place those in the middle of the table within reach of all players. Then place one of the cider tokens on the cider space of the board and place your round tracker on the starting place at the top and each player will need to place their cubes in the starting space marked by the arrow and torch on the reputation track. Also near the table you will need your encounter book so that you can pass this around and read out encounters for the other players. Once this is all done, randomly determine who your first player will be and give them the first player card. You will need to give each player seven of these coins to start with. And if you're playing a two player game, the second player will get one extra coin. In a three player game, both the second and third players get an extra coin. And in a four player game, only the fourth player gets the extra coin. And then this is how the table should look once you've got the game all set up for a two player game. So here we've got our first player who has seven coins, our second player who has eight coins. The aim of the game in Above and Below is to have the best village. And this is tracked by village points, which are awarded at the end of the game. Anything that has this hexagon with a number in will be giving you points at the end of the game. And the game will consist of seven rounds, which are marked by this track here. At the end of those seven rounds, whoever has the most village points will win. Each round is made up of a series of turns until each player has passed because they have no more available villagers to perform actions. So each action you're going to perform will require one or more villagers. And on each turn, you may only perform one of the main actions. There are also some free actions and I'll talk about those afterwards. The main actions that you can perform are all listed on your player board. So the first action that you have the option of performing is to explore. And it has a number two next to the icon for explore, as this signifies that you need two villagers in order to perform this action. So you would use two of your villagers and they would go exploring. When you go exploring, you will take the top cave card and you will place your villagers on it. Then you'll roll a dice to see what encounter you'll be dealing with. So in this case, I rolled a three. If we look, a three would be encounter 72. So you then get the encounter book and you want to open it up on the paragraph that has been indicated by the cave card and dice. So here we have paragraph 72, which would contain story text that you'd read aloud for the player. So this would be the other player reading this, not the player whose turn it is. Then you would ensure that you read out the text that's in bold. This will give the options for what that player can then choose to do. So in this case, it would then just result in paragraphs being read out. However, let's say we look, we're doing this paragraph 73 here. You can see that you have options, keep exploring, explore three or explore seven. So you would read those bits out, not the bits that are in brackets. Those are the rewards they will get if they complete that challenge. You'd read out each of the different options. So keep exploring, search for the gemstone, search for the gemstone and keep it, for example. And then once the player has decided which one they're going to do, they will then look back at their villagers and roll a dice for each villager. So for this villager here, I rolled a three. And you can see here, it tells you how many lanterns 
the villager gives you on certain die rolls. So if you roll a one, you'd get one lantern. If you roll three, you get two lanterns. Those two lanterns equal the number of successes. So if it was an explore two, I would have already succeeded with that. But it's unlikely to ever be that low. So let's see if I can get another lantern from this other person. And I rolled a five and I only needed a two for this villager in order to get a lantern. You will find that some encounters will give you different options or bonuses if one of the villagers that is on the adventure has either a feather or a hammer. So in this case, I reached for explore free and I would have succeeded on any explore free challenges. But what if I was trying to do an explore four challenge? I can still achieve this. By using these villagers, they will automatically go to your exhausted area marked with the moon on your play board. Anytime you use a villager for an action, it, that's where it will go. But when adventuring, you can choose to injure one or more of your villagers that went exploring in order to gain an additional lantern. So let's say I was trying to do an explore four, I could choose to injure this villager and that would now mean that I had the four lanterns that I needed. For succeeding, I would get any of the rewards stated in brackets for that explore rating for the option that I chose. Additionally, I get to take this cave card and add it to my village. I'll explain what they're used for shortly. If you fail to achieve the encounter, unless there is text to read out on a failure, you simply would not gain this cave card and it would get discarded to the bottom of the deck. Having done one of these major actions, it would then be the second player's turn who would choose to do an action. And let's say they choose the second action here. That is harvest. In order to do a harvest, they would already have to have a building that had tokens on it. So here you can see we have a building that gives a pair each round. So during the end of round, when you're refreshing, you will place a pair on there. And when you buy the card, it would come with a pair. So assuming this player had that in their area, they could choose to exhaust one of their villagers into the exhausted area as an action in order to harvest one good. Now they can exhaust multiple villagers to harvest multiple goods if they have them. Once you've harvested the good, it will simply sit in your player board until you choose to do anything with it. With player two's action done, it would then be background to player one. And let's say they're gonna choose the third action that you can choose to do, which is build. Now the build symbol also has a hammer next to it. This indicates that only villagers that have a hammer symbol on them are able to perform this action. So when you choose to build, you will simply exhaust a villager who has the hammer and then choose one of the available buildings. It can be one of the star ones, one of the key ones, one of the ordinary ones, or an outpost. However, you can only build an outpost if you have an empty cave. So that's what these are used as. They're foundations to enable you to build an outpost. When you do do a building, you will pay gold to the bank equal to the cost of the building shown in the top left. So let's say player one here chooses to buy this building. That will cost them three coins. So they'll pay three coins to the bank and then add this to their village. Whenever a card has a plus and an, another symbol there, that means it is gained as income. When it has a hand symbol, that means you gain it immediately. So on buying this card, they would also gain a potion. And then in future income stages, they would gain an extra coin. And when you have bought a building, you will refresh 
the buildings, replacing any empty spaces. Of course, that does not apply to the key buildings or to your star buildings, only to your basic buildings and your outposts. So now we're back round to player two, and let's say they're gonna perform the fourth action option, which is to recruit. And this has the feather symbol next to it to remind you that only villagers that have the feather symbol are able to perform this action. So player two will exhaust this villager with the feather in order to recruit one of the five villager options available on the reputation board here. The cost of recruiting is given beneath the villager. So we could purchase this villager here at a cost of two coins. And they would then go into our exhausted area of our player board. You do not then refresh your villagers. This will refresh at the end of round. Then as player two has done an action, it would be player one again. However, player one has no available villagers, therefore they must pass. At which point it goes back to player two. It's important to note there are some free actions and you cannot perform these after having passed. The final action that a villager can perform is to labor. Any villager can do this, there's no requirement on them having any of the symbols, hammers or feathers. And you can have multiple villagers at a time if you had them available. So if we say player two had two villagers available, they could send two villagers labouring as one turn. For each villager that you do send labouring, you will move them to your exhausted area and you will gain one gold. Additionally, if you're the first person in a round to perform the labour action, you may take the cider off of the reputation board and add this to your player area. At the end of the round, this cider will get refreshed. That is all of the actions that you can perform that use up your turn. But as I've mentioned, there are some free actions. The first free action you can do is on your turn, you may pay one gold in order to refresh either the buildings or the outposts here. You would simply remove what is there and deal out four new cards. However, you can only do this once a turn. Additionally, if you have any goods or ciders or potions, you are able to put them in the top left of your player board here. This represents that they are for sale. Any goods that are for sale, another free action that a player can perform is to buy a good that's for sale off another player. However, they must offer a minimum of free gold for that item and the player is able to refuse any offer. But once an offer has been accepted, you do have to adhere to it. This would then be the end of round as both players have exhausted all of their villagers. So we would then prepare for the next round first by moving our round marker. Then we would refresh our cider. Then we would refresh our villagers. So we've got an empty space here. So everyone that is currently on the reputation board slides down becoming cheaper to buy. And we then put out a new villager. Once this is done, you'll rest your villagers in order to get them from exhausted back to being available for the next round. First, if you have any ciders, you may spend these to move one villager who is exhausted from the exhausted area to the ready area. Also, if you have a potion such as this gave, you can expend these at this point in order to move an injured villager into the exhausted area. And you must rest your villagers using beds given by your building. So your starting building gives you free beds and other buildings will give you additional beds in order to rest 
more villagers. For each bed that you have, you may move one villager from injured to exhausted or from exhausted to ready. It's important to note that if you do have an injured villager and you have spare beds, you cannot use two beds on one villager to move them from injured to exhausted to ready. You can only do one step with a bed. So in this situation, both players were able to fully rest because this player used a cider in order to get their fourth villager back and this player used their potion to get their injured player back to exhausted. Then you would collect your income. So if you don't have any buildings that have a plus on, your income will be denoted by the items that you have. So initially at the start of the game, you'll simply gain four gold each turn. If however you have gained goods and chosen to put them on the track at the bottom of your player board, you would gain additional gold as listed above the good. So for the first good, you would gain, you'd go up from four to five, then to six, then you stay at six, then seven. Each of these slots on the board can only contain one type of good. And once you have put a good in a slot, it cannot be removed from there. Also, if you gain any more of that good, such as this pair here, if I gained another pair, I couldn't then choose to put it on a further slot. It has to continue to build up in that slot. This is important for the end game scoring because these goods are worth a number of village points as given above them. So the later a good is in the track, the more village points each individual good is worth. So what you want to do is have goods that you have very few of early on in the track to push you to later on. And then you want to build up lots of these goods that are worth more points. Once you have collected your income, you'll then refresh your goods on buildings. So that's any building that has this arrow icon next to a good, you'll place one of that good on that building, which is then available to be harvested during the coming round. If there is already a good on that building from a previous round, you do not put a new good there. Then the final thing we do is pass the first player marker to the left. Then we start the round with our first player. You'll continue this way until you reach the bottom of the track and that will then be your final round of the game. Then at the end of the game, you will total up all of your village points based on your track at the bottom here of what goods are giving you village points. Also any buildings that are giving you bonus points for having them, such as this one here that gives you three points, or the star buildings that give you points for having different types of goods or other conditions met. And additionally, you will get one point for every building and outpost that you have completed. Empty caves are not worth village points. Also, any goods that have not been placed on the track on your player board are not worth anything, neither are potions or ciders, unless you have a building that gives you points for those. The final way you will gain points at the end of the game is for this reputation track. And you can gain reputation moving down this track or potentially lose reputation moving up based on the outcome of adventures when you go exploring. If you reach a space that has village points noted on it, you will gain that many village points at the end of the game. Additionally, if you are the furthest down in a two player game, you will gain three points. If you're playing with more than two players, you would gain five points for being the furthest down. And then the second furthest would get three points. The third furthest would get two points. 
It's important to note that if you go up on this reputation track, it is possible to lose points. And that is how you play Above and Below. I do hope that you've enjoyed this video. Of course, if you have, please do check out the rest of my videos on the channel, subscribe to the channel and share the channel with your friends and family. And do also check us out on social media. You can find us on Facebook and on Twitter. And as always, thanks for watching and bye for now.